Hi everyone, my name is Laura Vergneau. Today I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my translation, a French novel by the writer Joyce Orman. In French it's called Science de la Vie, and in English, life sciences. Uh, the book is all about illness, um, specifically about a young 17-year-old girl whose family has been afflicted by a so-called curse since the Middle Ages. Since then, every eldest female daughter in her family has been struck by some form of an ever-mutating disease. In Ninon's case, this manifests as allodynia, which is a condition wherein one feels an intense burning sensation whenever the skin is touched. Ninon is determined to reject her family's dark legacy, however, and find a cure through science and reason. In addition to exploring the female experience of illness and healing, the novel acts as a parable about the power and danger of stories. So I will begin with a short excerpt in French, uh, followed by one in English. Mais les ressources de Ninon sont inépuisables, jamais accordées, de désirs impromptus, même si désormais circonscrits au seul champ médical. Elle se relève toujours, reprend ses esprits, mû par son acharnement à consulter, à débusquer le meilleur spécialiste, le traitement confidentiel. Et maintenant, comment n'y a-t-elle pas songé plus tôt Ninon veut être hospitalisée. But Ninon's resources are inexhaustible. She's never short on ideas, impromptu urges, even if now they're circumscribed to the medical universe. She always gets back up, pulls herself together, driven by a relentless need to consult a professional, to track down the best specialist, little known treatment. And now, how could she not have thought of it before? Ninon wants to be hospitalized. Really, that's what's missing from her impressive track her grand medical odyssey. And isn't it time to start over from the beginning, the exams and instruments, to once again abandon herself to the technosphere, to the experts and scientists, for them all to assemble at her bedside, every specialty gathered in a single spot, every hypothesis back on the table, and to once again find a retreat, solitude, somewhere she will be taken care of, the sweetness of dependency. For Ninon, the hospital is no longer an anxiety-producing place, consecrated to tragedy and bad omens, but on the contrary, an incredibly desirable and protective place. The gleaming linoleum, dim lighting, and faint smell of disinfectant and reheated food will bring her relief. The extraordinary medical network she's created over the last few months make it easy for her to be rapidly admitted to San Luis Hospital for a few days in the internal medicine department. At the hospital, Ninon gleefully blends in with the other patients, melts into a mass of kindred souls, pathologies milling together. She strolls along the outside paths as if she's in a garden of disease, planted with proliferating, pollinating species. Immediately feels at home in its hushed environment, a biological stomping ground where glances meet both empathy and humility and also submission. Ninon gets noticed right away in the department for her voluble interest in medical tests, her thirst to understand, her atypical symptoms, the abnormal extent of her allodynia covering both arms entirely. They've never heard of such a thing. It's never been seen before. And that, that is intriguing. Ninon is alone in her room, a luxury, waiting on the adjustable bed, the gown tied at her neck just barely covering her. Soon she'll be subjected to an interrogation about her medical history, her pain, her habits. All the questions she knows by heart and all the sterile responses that won't move the investigation forward. Three men in white coats and which are pin badges with names that Ninon deciphers and tries to retain surround the patient. A double evil. Movements frozen, mouths open and ready to speak, concerned looks. They're holding reassuring test results. No brain injury, zero non anomaly. And one of them, the one Ninon identifies as the chief, older, belly protruding, lifts a corner of her paper gown, palpates and probes for the umpteenth time in months. It's getting old. He applies pressure to her skin, to the organs beneath her skin, listens, taps, manipulates her joints, tests her reflexes, 
impotent like all the others before Ninon's silent body. The invisible symptom resistant to the medical art of observation, seeing as there's nothing to observe, nothing from which to draw a conclusion. Not a patch of red, not the shadow of a lump, not the hint of a deformation or deterioration that would guide a diagnosis. Nothing to sink your teeth into, nothing observable, and therefore nothing logical. When confronted with Nyon's case, the doctors are always hopelessly deprived of their senses. Their eyes, their eardrums, their fingers can't find anything. Normal cardiac rhythm, ideal pulse, no fever, no palpitations, no cramps, no yellowing of the whites of the eyes, no bleeding, no tumors, no swelling, no ganglions, no shortness of breath or congestion, no abnormal echoes in the thorax, no vibrations in the abdomen, no cracking in the bones, no rumblings in the stomach, an abyssal silence, nothing to bring back from the depths to the surface, an inscrutable surface, hopelessly opaque. It's always the same refrain. The youngest of the three doctors, who may or may not be joking in this moment, suggests opening Ninon up, since every external and radiological exam has failed, to finally see what's going on in this body's black box, to peacefully rummage around her insides, to penetrate the mystery of this magnificent and extensive allodynia that has never been categorized in medical literature, to finally be done with this thing that's resisting. Because joking or not, the young resident doesn't like being resisted. He sees himself as a soldier of health, hurling himself onto the patient's body, as if onto a battlefield. Onto Ninon, the theater of operations, complex landscape, surface worn by hollows and bumps, crevices and slopes, a terrain on which to deploy the forces, each doctor, each specialty representing an infantry corps. The young resident is daydreaming, but it's, one, it's what Ninon is imagining as well, a battlefield role to fight it out, and she feels like they're not fighting hard enough. Thank you all for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it.